next panelist is Deborah Sandler, who received her bachelor's in business administration and international business. She also holds an MBA from New York University Stern School of Business and an honorary PhD from the Long Island University School of Pharmacy. Deborah is also a member of Hofstra's Board of Trustees. Deborah is a global top level executive with strong marketing and operating management experience. She has led startups and brand innovations, launched mega brands, and developed award winning big idea campaigns and worked on multi billion dollar segments as a senior management team member. Deborah currently serves as president and chief executive officer of, of La Granada Group LLC, a privately held consulting firm focused on marketing innovation and overall business development. Deborah previously served as Chief Health and Wellbeing Officer at Mars Inc., where she was focused on accelerating Mars' goal of creating a comprehensive cross-segment strategy to drive change across all businesses. She also served as the strategic leader for Twix Global Brand and as president of Mars Chocolate North America, a tasty job if I ever heard of one. <laughs> There she led the $4 billion chocolate business, what a dream job, overhauled the North America supply chain and headed the opening of the $300 million Topeka Mars chocolate plant, the first US plant in 35 years. Prior to joining Mars, Deborah served as the worldwide president of McNeil Nutritionals, a division of Johnson & Johnson. She joined Johnson & Johnson as vice president of marketing in charge of the launch of Splenda. Under her leadership, Splenda was launched and grew to be the number one low-calorie sweetener in the United States and several markets around the world. Deborah started her career at Pepsi-Cola and spent 13 years at the company in various marketing leadership positions in the beverage and restaurant business. Deborah is a member of the board of directors of the Gannett Company and chair of the board's nominating and public responsibility committee. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Deborah Sandler. Thank you so much. It's always a little weird hearing yourself introduced. It's like, wow, that sounds pretty good. Who is that person? Um, so, um, pleasure for me to be here this evening. As I, as I stand here, again, like Julio, over 30 years ago, graduating from uh, Hofstra with my undergraduate degree in international trade, um, it's just pretty amazing and really fabulous. And I'm so grateful that uh, you invited me to come back today. Um, you know, when I think about uh, my experiences here, I mean, at the time uh, when I was applying, was 1977, 78, um, you know, a degree in international trade, an undergraduate degree in international trade was a, a very unusual thing. And Hofstra was one of the only schools that offered that at the time. And when I, you know, my first class, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. with Dr. Kaufman, General Business 101. Um, it's when I first started my love of business, and I found it here at Hofstra. I thought I was going to be an, econ uh, an economist, but uh, I took great courses with you know, Dr. Moore, who taught me about international business, with uh, somehow Quentin Tarantino allowed me, he taught me to love quantitative methods, 121. I don't know why or how that happened. June Zaccone, we would argue about development economics in China. Um, and first time I went to China and I saw a sea of bicycles, she was the first person who came to my mind. And so many pleasant memories and for the students in the room, I hope that you are, as you've heard from many of the alum, building relationships with your professors and, pre and, and other students that will last you a lifetime. I am a foodie, my passion is marketing. I've done marketing and general business, but my passion has always been marketing. And, um, and I found that passion here. Uh, and I would tell you, I feel very fortunate to have worked on the brands and the businesses that I have. But there's several trends that I'd like to talk about that I see in business that are, some of them are not new, but they're evolving. And so as I think about the topic, which is you know, the next 50 years of business, what's evolving? So when I came, this notion of international was, was evolving at the time. Um, you know, we had huge U.S. multinationals who were just realizing that the key was not just to take an American approach to everything. <laughs> uh, that was just starting. 
um, and that, that you needed really to have local talent, believe it or not, that, that was a new concept. Um, but there are several trends that I see happening that I think is really important because one of the things that I've done over the years is do a lot of recruiting, right? Whether it was Pepsi or J&J &J or Mars, I did a lot of recruiting. And I can tell you some of the things that uh, I see evolving, especially in, the, in, in business that hopefully you'll find helpful. So none, I don't think any of these things will be, will be uh, you know, new insights, but I do want to just sort of reinforce them. So something you've heard before, big data and analytics. You hear that all the time. Um, th this is what I can tell you, really important. <laughs> Be and, and not so much, um, you know, it, it's like, what does that really mean? But I can tell you from a practical standpoint, um, I think about when I first went to Mars and, you know, I met with the, the market insights team and they like, Deborah, we have great insights here. We have access to so much. We buy so much data. And I said, this is great because as a marketer, in, I'm an insight-driven market. I always want to get the voice of the consumer. And what I got on my desk every month was a blue book. It was, literally was called a blue book. And in flipping through that, it was page after page after page of numbers. Red, green, yellow numbers. No insight. And so the thing I would say to you, when you think about big data and analytics, if you can be that person who can turn that data into an insight, that'll drive the growth <laughs> that most people are looking for. It's not just, I think part of we, we get caught up with, yes, there's this data, there's access. We have more data now, we have access to more data now than I think we ever even dreamed possible. But the issue is not just the data, it's what are you doing with that data? And quite honestly, some of it do you really need? How will you prioritize? How will you turn that data into an insight that will sell more products, services that will drive the growth that your company is looking for. The flip side of that is the protection of that data. So in most firms that I work with right now, the one specialty that we just can't get enough of is people who understand cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. How do we protect our data? How do we protect it from you know, people stealing our data, infiltrating our data, here and globally. And there literally are not enough people that can help us with this. The other trend I'll tell you about, which again, not new, but it's the importance of technology. And not just technology for the sake of technology, but the, the, the speed of change that technology brings. I lived, I grew up uh, you know, doing marketing where you know, big innovations would come every 5, 10, 15 years. Now it's going to be 5, 10, 15 months, <laughs> right? Uh, 5, 10, 15 weeks, right? Companies, products are being eradicated with new, with new insight, with new data, with new services. Someone talked about Uber, right? A lot of people didn't see that coming, but it really was based on a simple insight, and that is, hey, guess what? If you've ever stood in New York City and you can't get a cab at five o'clock, right? If I can, on my app, call up that cab, yes, not only will I pay the surge charge, I'll get from where I'm going to where, to where I am to where I'm going, right? And I know cab drivers in New York City don't love them, but I don't care because those cab drivers would pass me by straight, right? And so understanding that change, you've got to learn to be comfortable with change. Right? That technology brings change, technology brings ideas. And everyone says, I'm comfortable with change, but honestly, um, if you, when you are in the middle of change, when something that you've been working on for, and you thought would last for five, 10 years is being, is being <laughs> eradicated uh, much sooner than you thought, then the thing is, how do I, how do I re-engage and rebuild? The other trend, the death of the mass market. Um, I started to say the death of mass, but I'm Catholic and it's Easter, the death of mass doesn't sound right. So the death of the mass market. So again, um, there was an era in business where it really all, it was about how can you get to the scale of mass production? And that's still wonderful because there are economies of scale there. But the reality is in most business that those large production products <laughs> are being, they're getting their lunch eaten from the fringe 
from smaller products, from smaller companies that can innovate and take risks and do things and change and be nimble. Right? And so customization is the new word. Now, customization and mass just don't always go together. And so as you think about a career in business, make sure that you're understanding the importance of targeting. We talk about social media and digital. I'm here to tell you, I've worked with some of the best organizations, the best marketing groups um, in, in, in not just the companies that I've worked with, but with people from other corporations. Most companies haven't quite figured out social and digital yet, certainly from a marketing perspective. We know it's important. We know that's where the consumers are. The business model of how to, how to really drive and sell products through social and digital, eh, we're still experimenting. And so take the classes, you know, um, take the classes in social and digital. Make sure you understand how it works because it is going to, not only do you, should you understand how it works, it will evolve as you know, right? And many of the people who are in businesses today, I can tell you, you will know more than your boss. <laughs> right? By the time you get out of school, you will know more than the people that you're working for. So to, if that's something new that you're bringing to the table, it will be valuable. The environment. When I came to school at Hofstra, it was not really a conversation. But today, tomorrow, and for the next few years, understanding the importance of the carbon footprint of your business, understanding the role your business, your company, has on the environment, and what it's doing to enhance, improve, or if nothing else, to reduce its, or its carbon footprint, really, really critical. And I, know, I, 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 I don't know if we have a, a specialization in, in the environment here, but I will tell you it is one of those areas in business that is growing and that they're not, there's not much competition yet uh, with people who understand you know, the role of the environment in business and what companies should and shouldn't be doing and how to, how to do good and do well at the same time. Really, really critical. So I'll give you a perfect example. Running you know, 10 manufacturing plants at Mars, the use of water, all right, really critical. And our goal was to be, you know, to reuse the water 100%. Now, I also have to balance the money that I'm putting into that with the money to launch new products, you know, like crispy M&Ms <laughs> and, uh, and Twix bars. And the reality is, well, the beauty of actually working with a privately held company is that the Mars family actually values the way we use water more than the new launch. Now, not all companies are like that, but you know, those things are going to evolve. Um, the other thing I would say to you, hold on as I relaunch my page here, um, health and wellness. So I was health and wellness, a chief health and wellness officer for Mars, and you might say, what does a chief health and wellness officer do for a candy company? Um, <laughs> People love candy, it makes you smile. Um, <laughs> the good news is Mars is not only a candy company. Um, uh, the, the, you know, candy is about 40% though. But the conversation really is about, can you afford to be a candy company 20 years from now? Or can you afford to be 40% dependent on high fat, high sugar products? Or do you need to evolve and change your business portfolio? These are the conversations that most corporations are having. And so one of the things that I have found is now that I'm doing sort of consulting is that everybody wants to know what is the impact of my business, my products, my services on health and wellness? How can, because, because it's what the consumer market is concerned about. It's what consumers are thinking about. And so in businesses, you then have to be able to reflect uh, and respond to the consumer needs. And it, it, health and wellness may be a buzz term, but the reality is certainly as a foodie, I can tell you there's not one food company that's not thinking about it. Right? Not thinking about the, the, the products and the product profile, and that includes candy companies. <laughs> right? and, not, and no companies that are not thinking about how to evolve and to serve better uh, products for people. So the last thing I would say, so to, you know, to those trends, big data and analytics, uh, technology-driven speed of change. I would tell you in technology, make sure that you learn how to 
fail fast, you innovate, innovate often and quickly and fail fast. The death of mass. Um, the, the last thing I would talk about would be globalization. Uh, again, not new. But globalization tomorrow, I think, will be a little bit different than globalization when I started. When I started, it was about learning a language. It was about being open to maybe going abroad for a stint. Um, today and in the future, it really is about comfort with dealing with different markets, different people, uh, different economies, and to be able to flex your style accordingly. And so, and I can tell you the only way to do that is to get experience. You can't learn it in a book. There's certain things you can learn, but you have to be prepared. And I speak directly to the students. Get out there, go to different markets, live as an expat in, in a different market for as long as you possibly can to learn because that there's nothing like having that the ground uncomfortable <laughs> beneath your feet, which is, eh, I don't either know the language, I'm not quite comfortable with the culture. It actually enhances your ability to learn to communicate and get along um, for most people, uh, but it will also it'll make you a better executive once you've done that because you also understand how to deal with different people. And then the last thing I would say, so you know, globalization, and we talked about environmental controls. The last thing I would say, it would be a personal appeal for the future leaders. Um, we, you, <laughs> uh, we all live, live in, an, in an era now where we live in our phones, we live in our devices, we live on social media, and we don't always, we sometimes lack that interpersonal skill there will always be a need for leaders who know how to manage talent. There will always be a need for leaders who actually know how to lead, who people want to follow. Inspirational leadership is one of the hardest things to find. And I will tell you that you need to put the devices down, interact, live outside of the device. It will make you, and, and I feel like an old, old lady saying some of these things, but the reality is, it just makes you a better person and a better leader. Build your social skills. You know, really build, in, in, spend the time to build the social skills, to get comfortable with people, to be curious about people, to be curious about things and people that are different from you. Uh, there is no way that we can teach that in school, that level of curiosity, but I can tell you when you start to have the jobs at some of the the roles that some of the people around this table have, if you can't get along with people who are different, if you can't get comfortable, not just get along, be comfortable and be curious and be interested in people, you will not survive. The world is changing, it's more and more diverse, and if you really want to enjoy it, you have to live in it. Thank you.